Hello everyone. Well, I'm back in action. The reason for this little delay that we had this week is because the software that I use to uh, transform the PowerPoint into movies malfunctioned terribly and I had to wait for replacement discs, which finally arrived. So there's a little delay here, but don't worry, I will give you all plenty of extra time. This is a special lecture that I put together to discuss the relationship between art and fashion. The purpose of the lecture is threefold. One, like I always tell you, there are things that an educated person is just expected to know, right? Especially a college graduate. You are expected to know your impressionism from your post-impressionism, modernism from post-modernism, futurism from pop art. An educated person just knows these things. They also know who the key artists of the 20th century were. And so this will, um, I suppose, kind of round, round off your cultural education that you take with me. Um, I'm only going to f focus on the really famous movements and really famous artists in terms of their influence on fashion. It is not... Uh, uh, the completely extensive full list. There are people like Marcel Duchamp, who you should really know about, but I'm not going to cover him here, and I'll tell you for why, because he doesn't really influence fashion um, in the way that these other artists do. I'm not going to talk about installation art. You know, when artists get a bunch of bricks or something and bring them into a gallery or build something within a gallery, again, because it doesn't impact fashion today. I'm not going to be talking about land art, um, that art movement when somebody gets the Brooklyn Bridge and wraps it in pink silk, for example. Land art is fun and dramatic and beautiful, but again, it doesn't impact fashion. I'm really going to go for the key art movements and artists who keep reappearing as an influence for fashion. One, that's one of the reasons to round off your education. Two, you need to be aware of who these are these designers and stylists and magazine editors and photographers are referencing because when you write about it or you are working on a, I don't know a creative team and they say okay let's do a, a layout based on Italian futurism you're gonna to have to know what Italian futurism is if somebody says to you go out and get me a bunch of Gauguin inspired prints you have to know who Gauguin is right two but three, for those of you wanting to go into fashion writing or magazine work, art gives you a whole new vocabulary to use. Even if the designer hasn't intentionally and deliberately been inspired by, I don't know, Van Gogh, like in these two pictures here, you could talk about a Van Gogh palette, couldn't you? You could talk about a post-impressionist design. Um, you could talk about uh, a dress that evokes um, the, the spirit of Starry Night. So you can use art as a wonderful toolbox with which to describe color, describe patterns, and describe the spirit of something. It will really improve your fashion writing. It will really improve your magazine editorial work. So um, threefold, threefold purpose to this lecture, and I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to crack on. First thing though, fear no art. I know there's something very scary about art, isn't there? Especially 20th century art. Because of all the isms. You hear ism, cubism, futurism, modernism, postmodernism. You hear an ism and you think, oh my god, this is going to be scary. Well, guess what? If you were an art history undergrad, as I was, some of the isms are a bit scary and involve an awful lot of art theory. A degree in art history is hard, I know, because that's what my degree is in. Fear no art, though. Ism is just the term that we use to group together uh, individuals with the same idea. Sometimes these individuals knew each other, sometimes they didn't. And to sort of give a blanket description to a particular kind of art. Ism is nothing to be scared of. Fear no art at all. There is not an artist who has ever walked the planet who painted beautiful paintings because he hoped that one day undergrads would be tested on him. 
There is no artist who ever did that. In fact, most artists would be horrified to know that their work was even being studied in a college. They painted and created art for the same reason we enjoy it. Because it's beautiful and exciting and wonderful and because they had to. So fear no art and let's go into this lecture excited, excited about art. Here's a little reminder for you to remind you that fashion today has always and always will be inspired by artistic movements of the past. Remember we looked at Anglo-Saxon art, art from the Carolinian Renaissance, Viking art, and we saw its influence today, especially on jewellery here. Remember Byzantine art, these wonderful mosaics? Well, we discussed uh, the influence of the Byzantium Empire on fashion today. Same with medieval art, same with Elizabethan art, and remember Baroque, the huge Baroque movement of the 17th century with all of this opulent gold? Well, we saw how often designers will launch a Baroque collection. Just as they launch Rococo collections, remember Rococo in the 18th century, all of the prettiness and lace and bows and this wonderful light pastel palette. And we saw how often fashion designers, stylists, etc. go back to Rococo. But this lecture is going to focus specifically on art movements of the 19th century onwards, okay? when we start getting our isms. So before um, further ado, sit back, enjoy this. You can review all of this in the uh, uploaded PowerPoint, but I would also really like you to maybe find a favorite here and research it a little further. I really want you to know about art simply because I want you to all be educated and cultured individuals who can hold their own at a cocktail party. All right, here we go. The first group of people I want to talk to you about are the Pre-Raphaelites. Okay, who were the Pre-Raphaelites and why did they have this odd name? The Pre-Raphaelites were a group of young artists operating in and around London in the middle of the 19th century, the 1840s, 1850s, going into the 1860s, this era. And what does the word pre-Raphaelite mean? Why did they call themselves the pre-Raphaelites? They called themselves the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, in fact. Well, pre, of course, means before. And Raphaelite refers to Raphael, who was a Renaissance painter and sculptor. So pre-Raphaelite means pre-Renaissance. They could have equally called themselves the pre-Michelangeloites or the pre-Leonardoites, but Raphaelite sounded better and flowed better. So they were the pre-Raphaelites and they referenced a world before the Renaissance. And what was the world before the Renaissance? It was the medieval world, remember. The pre-Raphaelites were obsessed with the Middle Ages. Um, the reason they were obsessed with the Middle Ages is that they were all part of what is known as the Gothic Revival, the Arts and Crafts Movement, the Pre-Raphaelites. Um, remember, we uh, discussed uh, briefly the Gothic Revival of the 19th century, and um, it was a reaction, basically, to the Industrial Revolution. Suddenly the landscape was changing, all of these factories appearing. Um, cotton factories, for example, billowing black smoke into the sky, urbanization, um, the first steam trains, the world was changing very rapidly. And there was this huge romantic movement um, towards the medieval era, uh, to an, uh, a world that people kind of fantasized about, of being filled with knights in sh shining armor and damsels in distress and dragons and castles. And uh, we all know the Middle Ages wasn't quite like that. It was pretty bleak, actually, for most people. But the Pre-Raphaelites had a very romanticized uh, version of this. The mid-19th century was a very romantic time as a reaction, a backlash to the Industrial Revolution. And I would argue that we are going through our own Gothic revival, slightly romantic period 
right now in the 21st century as a backlash or the flip side, if you will, to technology. Think about it. All of the vampire books and movies, all of the zombie uh, TV shows and movies. We love vampires. We love zombies, um, werewolves, all of this kind of stuff, which is anti-science, isn't it? It's the unknowable. Think about Harry Potter. What did he want to do? He wanted to be a wizard. So everything that we kind of like culturally involves uh, the night. It involves the unknowable. It involves uh, mythical creatures like vampires and zombies. And we've made them all quite romantic. And again, I really feel that this is a backlash to all of the technology that dominates our lives in much the same way that this interest in the Middle Ages, which really was a fad, a craze, a trend, if you will, in the mid-19th century, was a backlash to the Industrial Revolution. Okay, here is an image, very typical image of a pre-Raphaelite painting. And you can see you have this romanticized uh, medieval-looking woman uh, in a sort of fantasized a uh, romanticized medieval room with these roses and candles and this sort of a semi-gothic arched window here. Here is another pre-Raphaelite painting. The pre-Raphaelites loved Arthurian legend. Arthurian, King Arthur. They loved the story of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And here is the Lady of Shalott. Um, take a look. She's in a very... Um, rural setting, of course, because they were anti-industry, a rural setting. She's wearing a kind of fake medieval looking dress, pseudo medieval dress, although, you know, it's not terribly inaccurate. Um, there's that very medieval looking textile draped over her, her little boat there. And uh, take a look at the kind of uh, misty, sort of mystical uh, handling here. You can almost see her floating towards you in the mist. This is Ophelia, very, very famous painting. And again, a very romanticized view. Here is Ophelia floating in a lily pond. Um, absolutely gorgeous, but you can really see the interest in nature here as well. I want you to note the palette, very soft, lots of greens. Because, of course, it was uh, um, all about rural things. So a lot of greens, a lot of flowers. And the pre-Raphaelite painters always painted the same type of woman. They used uh, their mistresses as their models. And take a look at these women. They all have a very similar look. Very long, wild auburn hair. Very pale skin and these puffy, puffy lips. There was a name given to the women in pre-Raphaelite paintings. They were known as the stunners, pre-Raphaelite stunners. And every hip, artistic, for want of a lack of a better word, trendy women in London at that era wanted to look like a pre-Raphaelite stunner and they would henna their hair to try to get at this gorgeous auburn color. They would make their faces very pale and they would chew on their own lips so that their lips would become swollen and puffy like the pre-Raphaelite stunners. And so the reason I'm telling you about the pre-Raphaelites is that fashion goes back to the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood constantly. Okay, what's pre-Raphaelite about this? Well, of course, the palette. Look at those greens. Look at that teal. The pre-Raphaelites loved teal, this very bluish green. Look at the flowers, look at the model with her long flowing kinky auburn hair. Look at that dress, which is sort of a fantasy view of a medieval dress. We know that medieval costume didn't look that way. Um, however, the whole thing is obviously influenced by the pre-Raphaelites. As this, this obviously referencing Ophelia, there is the model. Look how pale she is again with this long flowing auburn hair climbing out of a lily pond. And again here, I don't even think I need to tell you why this is pre-Raphaelite. She's in this um, kind of pseudo medieval setting with that wood panel behind her, the long flowing hair and the very medieval looking garment she's wearing. 
And again here, Ophelia being referenced by a stylist and photographer, and just to remind you of the original painting. But boy, fashion loves this painting and goes back to it time and time again. All right, a little bit later, we're going to move on to our next very, very important art movement, which I know you've all heard of, right? Impressionism, also known as French Impressionism because it came out of France. May we? Oui. So Impressionism, think about the 1860s through 80s, okay, this sort of time chunk. And I want you to know that the word Impressionism was actually first coined as an insult. There was an exhibition of Impressionist paintings, and uh, the art critic who was reviewing it said, oh, these paintings are rubbish, they don't look like bridges or churches or anything, they just give an impression of a church, an impression of a bridge, an impression of a flower. So it actually started as a bit of an insult. But the Impressionist painters didn't want things to look realistic or uh, lifelike or photogenic. Um, no idea of photorealism. At this uh, period in history, um, art was governed by the Salon. What was the Salon? Well, well the Salon, which was in Paris, was kind of, uh, you could look at it like an exhibition space, really, by today's terms. It's where painters would exhibit their work and it would be reviewed and critiqued. And there was a hierarchy. Um, history paintings, paintings that told great Greek legends or stories of great battles in history, they were at the top of the heap. Nothing was more important in the hierarchy. And uh, then it went down, so on and so forth. I can't remember the exact order. But, you know, portraiture was more important than landscape, for example. Still life was kind of at the bottom of the rung. I mean, come on, you can have um, a great battle from Greek mythology compared to a, the, a painting of an apple. What's going to be more important? Well, obviously, the big battle. The Impressionists did not care about the hierarchy of art at all. They wanted to get away from the idea that stuff had to be realistic, and they wanted to um, express a feeling, to really express an emotion, an emotion that you get whilst looking at this beautiful covered bridge over a stream with lilies in it. The impression that you get, the feeling that you get um, while looking at a sunset over a lake, the feelings that you get when sitting in a cafe in Paris. They weren't interested in things looking realistic. They wanted to evoke a feeling. So let's look at some of the famous Impressionists. There were many more, but I'm going to talk to you about the household names. Starting with this guy, Renoir. I am sure you have heard of Renoir. Here is his little girl in blue. And here is one of his little cafe scenes. I would really like you to note his very loose brush stroke, um, his uh, uh, very, very loose stylings. It gives an impression, doesn't it? He could make all of this look much more realistic, but he wasn't interested in that. He wants to evoke an atmosphere. And he really does, doesn't he, with these lovely cafe scenes and uh, children in parks and things like that. Okay, does anybody know this artist? He is called Degas, and he was famous for painting ballerinas. And again, this very loose brush stroke, but it evokes the spirit of the ballet, doesn't it? And of course, the big guy. I know you've heard of him, Monet. Now, Monet is very, very important um, to art because his brush stroke and his vision got so loose that many people think that it was the start of abstract art, the start of um, expressionist art. Monet would probably have said, no, this is a lily pad. But there is an argument that it's so loose and it's so free that it's almost abstract. Please note his palette as well, the teals, the um, sea foams, the indigos, these dashes of yellow and vermilion and uh, fuchsia, very Monet palette. 
again here take a look at this Monet the Bridget Gervenet which is where he lived um, and he painted many 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 times because the Impressionists went back and they repainted themes different seasons different lighting very very loose um, this alive with these wonderful yellow tones and I don't think I even need to tell you why this dress is inspired by Impressionism as you've seen the Impressionists loved flowers and uh, so you could look at this and describe it as being inspired by Impressionism both in palette and in the pattern on the dress as is this one and I love this with the dappled bits of light coming through very Impressionist and look at this shoe note the palette note that kind of loose a uh, very free um, very smudgy I always think that Impressionism is very smudgy um, that's a good word to use for it not a very uh, good word when you're writing an art history undergrad paper to describe it as a smudgy but you are I it's very smudgy isn't it very soft there's a real softness and gentleness about Impressionism and here again here's a photo shoot obviously inspired by Impressionism Now, an aspect of Impressionism that not all Impressionist painters used, um, in fact, very few did, was a technique called pointillism. And if you want to be very posh, you can say it in the French way, pointisme, pointillism. And the most famous artist who embraced this technique is a guy called Seurat. Seurat, all right? Always try to say these names if they're foreign, if they're French, in the French style, if they're Italian, in the Italian style. Don't say surate. He's called Sura. And if you can't get that R sound, Sura is fine. Um, here is his most famous painting. This shows an afternoon at Le Grand Jatte, which is, you know, a little park by the Seine. And uh, you can see it's not very realistic looking. No, that's why well, he wasn't interested in that but it certainly gives an impression doesn't it of a lovely relaxing Sunday afternoon but to really understand his technique pointillism take a look at his rendering of the Eiffel Tower here and you can see the entire canvas is made up of all of these little dots that he would make with the point of his paintbrush which is why it is called pointillism pointillism really here is a detail really focusing in where you can see all of these microscopic little dots that go forth to make up the canvas. As his career progressed, he was more interested in these little dots than he was in the subject, really. But again, I want you to note the palette. Really impressionist. So, when you're describing something like this, how cool to be able to discuss Pointillism. This shirt uses pointillism. This is how you would describe this shirt. All right, moving into the next main phase that we're going to be looking at. We're talking now the ooh, 1870s, 80s, 90s, post impressionism. Post impressionism, the movement that came after impressionism. And I think you're going to know a few of these artists. I'm going to talk to you only about the three main post-impressionist painters, Gauguin, Cézanne, and of course, you all know this dude, right? Vincent van Gogh. So the, the post-impressionist basically took some of the ideas of impressionism, this idea of um, getting away from any notion of realism and using brush stroke and color to evoke um, an atmosphere to another level to kind of a spiritual level almost let's take them one by one because they're important Cezanne I am sure you have heard of Cezanne look how very very loose his brush stroke is it really is almost an abstraction isn't it he also painted, as well as these uh, very loose landscapes, fruit. He loved painting fruit. Very naive looking, isn't it? Believe me, if Suzanne wanted to paint a totally realistic pear or apple, he could have done. But this wasn't of interest to the post-impressionists uh, at all. They intentionally 
wanted to take painting back to a naive state. And again, here you can see Suzanne doing just that. Um, it's almost like a, a child painted it, or an amateur, very folk arty, but this was very intentional. The same can be said of Gauguin. Now, he was French. All of these guys kind of hung out together and painted in the south of France. But Gauguin is famous for moving to French Polynesia, to Tahiti, where he really embraced the color, the vibrancy of Polynesia. Now, he used a lot of arbitrary color. What do we mean by arbitrary color? Well, arbitrary color um, means just that. We know that uh, uh, the sky isn't purple, but he would paint a purple sky. He would paint uh, pink rocks. He would uh, paint yellow waterfalls. So the color choices were arbitrary. Um, he really loved painting the local ladies, many of whom were his mistresses, and he made himself a bit unpopular in Tahiti, to be honest, by having so many girlfriends. But you can see, look at his technique. It's very uh, naive, intentionally so, of course. It was getting away from the whole idea of the salon and who could paint a glass to make it look the most realistic. Completely different. Here is another Gauguin. really shows uh, the use of arbitrary color here. Take a look at this lake that the central figure has her, or lagoon that she has her feet in, and those swirls of pinks and uh, salmons and uh, oranges. We know that water isn't that color, right? But this palette is so Gauguin. And so when discussing fashion, you can talk about a palette drawn from Gauguin. I am sure that none of these designers were actually thinking of Gauguin when they created these collections, but look at these collections juxtaposed with Gauguin, and you can see that this makes a wonderful way for you to describe such items, right? And of course, the big guy you all know about him, Vincent van Gogh. Now, although um, van Gogh hung out in the south of France with his friend Gauguin, etc. He um, was Dutch. He was a Dutch gentleman. And poor Vincent, he was a very unhappy gentleman. He was extremely unsuccessful during his life as a painter. And I always think it would be really cool if Van Gogh, poor Vincent, could come back just for one day and learn that his painting, Sunflowers, sold for more money than any other painting that has ever been. It is still the most expensive, priceless, really, painting in the world. You can see Van Gogh, he loved these vibrant blues, indigos, and these oranges and terracotta uh, tones for his sunflowers and his cornfields. Extremely naive, not much depth there. Look, there's no shadows with those sunflowers at all. Again, that's not the point. It was intentionally naive, and Van Gogh particularly wanted to get across a spirituality in his paintings, a sense of emotion, how he was feeling about what he saw. And of course, one of his most famous paintings is this one, Starry Night. And you can see how abstracted it all really is. This church, tower, spire, um, or a tree. I mean, I'm not even sure what that is in the front, actually. You know, uh, it's open to debate. I think it's a tree in the foreground. And then the village behind, and then this incredible swirling sky. He really wanted to get across the majesty and mysticism of the night sky. And he wasn't going to do that just by painting realistic stars and clouds. No, he did this incredible swirling uh, canvas with this very, very loose brush stroke. And I don't think I even need to tell you why these collections are so obviously inspired by Van Gogh. And so even if a designer wasn't as intentionally inspired as these designers were, you could still talk about a Van Gogh palette. Uh, you could talk about a post-impressionist uh, um, design or pattern and loose brush stroke and this kind of thing. All right. The first key art movement of the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, is Art Nouveau. And I know that many of you have already discussed Art Nouveau with me before. It was a dominant, the dominant uh, design aesthetic in interiors and in homeware and in wallpaper and in architecture, everything. Take a look at it. 
It's all organic, these organic swirls. Again, a reaction to modernization. The, the, the world was really changing at the turn of the, the 19th to the 20th century, the turn of the century. Um, electricity had been uh, sort of invented, if you will, discovered. At least we'd learned how to harness electricity. And so electric light lit up the world. It was the time when the first motor cars started appearing, electric tram cars. So, of course, people do what they do. It was too much change, too sudden, too scary. People loved it. Telephones, electricity, come on, who wouldn't love that? But in terms of design, they reverted to the past. And Art Nouveau borrowed from Celtic design, Anglo-Saxon design, medieval design. Look at all of these swirling shapes. It drew from nature. Everything looked organic and as if it was growing. And in terms of fine art, this is the guy you need to know in association with Art Nouveau. He was called Alphonse Mucha. Now, at the time, he wasn't considered a fine artist. He was a commercial artist. He did posters and calendars and ads for beer and labels for champagne bottles and stuff like that. Now, however, we understand that he is a fine artist and uh, the person we associate the most with the Art Nouveau movement. He mainly did these pseudo-medieval looking figures, kind of borrowing a little bit from excuse me, the pre-Raphaelites of uh, 20 or so years before. And look at their long flowing gowns, their long flowing hair, almost like the roots of a tree. Look at the palette, all of these russet tones, these blues, these greens, very dark teal, really incredible. But everything curvilinear and flowing and organic, no sharp edges. Here is another very typical Mucha image this flowing gown and flowing hair. And here is a very famous ad he did for beer. Take a look. A lot of flowers always appear in uh, Mooka's work. Um, nature, of course. But take a look also at the typography there, this hand-drawn uh, font, Beer de la Muse, um, ad for beer. Right, so keep that Mooka Art Nouveau image in mind. And then... Take a look at this. Uh, this is Anna Sui from a couple of years ago. Hello, can anyone say Art Nouveau? Look how deliberately um, inspired by Art Nouveau this is and uh, Mooka. Look at the palette. Look at the swirling design. Look at her, her poppies on the side of her head, exactly like in the Mooka beer ad. Again, take a look at this um, ad completely inspired by Art Nouveau, as is this, as is this, as is this Prada ad, and look at these incredible Art Nouveau shoes. So when you're talking about anything like this, if you fail to mention Art Nouveau in your fashion copy, then you will really be in trouble and you might get fired because it is so obviously Art Nouveau, but you're not going to do that, are you? Because you know what Art Nouveau is now. Another artist who's kind of associated with the Art Nouveau um, period, uh, turn of the century, is this guy, Gustav Klimt. I know you have all seen this image. It's called The Kiss. It's his most famous image. And um, Klimt was inspired by what? Can you guess? Byzantine art. All of those gold and indigo and lapis lazuli mosaics. Here is another Klimt. Look how very Byzantine it looks. Kind of mosaic. So keep these images in mind. Here's another one. Very mosaicish. All of these golds, bronze, brass tones, then with these bits of incredible lapis lazuli or indigo thrown in. So look at these images, then look at this Prada ad. I think you can see that this whole campaign was inspired by Klimt, as was this incredible gown by, I think, Oscar de la Renta. All right, going into the beginning of the 19th century, the, mo the 20th century, excuse me, going into the 20th century, sort of the 1910s, we encounter our first truly, I suppose, a modernist, you could kind of say, in as much as this art movement, Fauvism, was a complete rejection of the modern world. 
fauvism, the fauvist. What does fauve mean? Fauve is the French for wild beast, but not like a, a growling wolf or an angry bear. A wild beast, like a wild woodland creature going about its business. The fauves loved arbitrary colour. They were obsessed with it, and they had a really lovely palette made up of these coral tones and uh, indigo tones. But the whole point of fauvism is that these guys, this collection of guys, really thought that in this modern world of electricity and tram cars and planes, that we human beings had lost touch with our true place in nature and that we should return to our natural state. Um, I'm only going to talk to you about three Fauvist painters. Derain, this guy, who did this lovely painting of a bridge. Vlamanc, who did paintings like this. You can see there's similarities between the two. But again, look at the use of arbitrary colour. He's put these little farmers, Vlamanc has, in this field. They're ploughing a field or planting seeds. But we know that fields are not... Uh, coral colour or hot pink or that weird lime green. And the most famous of all, Matisse. I am sure you have heard of Matisse, okay. Matisse was the most famous and this painting you're looking at here is one of the most famous paintings of the 20th century. It's called Calm Luxe et Volupté, which I'm sure you can guess means calm, luxurious and voluptuous by Henri Matisse, 1904. And um, it's an extremely important painting. It's world famous, and I believe it lives at MoMA, so you can go and see it in real life. Uh, Matisse is using his own form of pointillism here, isn't he? Look at all of these little dashes that make up this canvas. Uses arbitrary color. Very naive. Uh, the foes were very inspired by ancient Greece an ancient Grecian art that you sort of find on uh, sort of Etruscan vases and things. And um, the idea behind this painting of these lovely, plump, voluptuous ladies enjoying a tea party on a beach is that what Matisse is trying to do here with his technique is show you that man, as represented by these ladies, belongs in nature because these ladies are painted with the same palette, the same colors and the same technique as the beach, as the trees, as the sky, as the clouds, as the boat. He's saying that there's no hierarchy in nature at all, that we all are made up of the same thing. We belong to the earth, we are no better than it, and we should refind our place in nature. And Fashion loves the fauves. Here is another fauves canvas. I think this one is by Duran. Again, take a look at the brush stroke. Take a look at this vibrant arbitrary color. And then take a look at this Marc Jacobs. Hello, I think you can see how very, very directly Marc Jacobs was uh, referencing fauvism here. Here is a detail. I can't remember who, which designer this is, but take a look at the detail Look at the pattern, look at the print on this dress, and then look at Calm Luxe Volupté, and you can see absolutely the Fauvist influence. And again here, so when talking about this kind of stuff, when talking about arbitrary colour, um, certainly use the word Fauvist. It'll really improve your writing. At about the same time elsewhere in Europe, um, the modern world, this new 20th century that was full of electricity and tram cars and urbanization and industry, was seen in a very different way. Far from rejecting all of this and getting back to nature, German Expressionism threw a sinister spotlight on the new urban landscape. And the most important artist you need to know from this movement is this guy. He painted these panels that you're looking at here. He's called Kirchner. And I want you to take a look at how the city is depicted through Kirchner's eyes. Sinister, right? Very jagged. Primitive, yes, indeed. Um, but in a very different way to the Fauvists. 
it was all about dark shadows, very jagged, very jagged, sharp looking images. Because the German Expressionist movement loved woodcuts. Whoops, I'll just go back here. Woodcuts, you know, when you get a piece of wood and you carve into it and you make these very primitive prints out of them. Uh, take a look at these woodcuts. They're very jagged. Um, they're very stylized. And the look of a woodcut translated to paintings. As you can see, these very jagged looking dark shapes, a lot of black, a lot of black outlines. Take a look at this painting, Arbitrary Use of Color. Again, look at the pavement. We know sidewalks aren't lime green. Um, we know the sky isn't coral color, but it is in Kirchner's painting of prostitutes. He painted a lot of prostitutes. These are ladies of the night in their long, slinky, elegant um, Edwardian uh, outfits, dresses and hats, and look at that long line of sinister looking men behind them. So, when you see things like this, you could certainly describe them as having a German Expressionist feel to them. Um, I would say that although the central um, picture there, I think that's uh, Jacobs for Vuitton, is it not? And the one next to it, which I believe is Galliano, although they're very ex German expressionist in period and in palette, I would say that the uh, image on the left here of this very jagged, sharp looking tuxedo jacket was probably the most German expressionist. So you can see what I'm doing here, guys. I'm giving you a whole new vocabulary and an a incredible uh, um, range of new adjectives to use in your fashion writing or in your magazine work, right? But the people who embraced the new 20th century and loved it were these guys. They were from Italy and they were the futurists. This movement is called Futurism or Italian Futurism. And here they are. They were all mates. They were all pals. They worked together. They inspired each other. They showed off terribly, rendered themselves extremely unpopular because they believed that everything before them, basically, be burnt to the ground, that anything Michelangelo did should be put on a big bonfire and burnt. The Sistine Chapel should be completely uh, blown apart. They believed that Italy's Renaissance fame and Renaissance pa past was stopping Italy moving into the future. It may come as no surprise to learn that many of these guys eventually became pals with Mussolini. Um, futurism, sadly, is a bit tied with fascism as well. But this first wave of futurism, let's be fair, it was long before Mussolini anyway. Here they are, the futurists. Rusulo, he did futurist music, which is so horrible to listen to and so offensive. Um, I think you should go on YouTube and uh, type in Rusulo and listen to some of this. Um, it is intentionally obnoxious. These guys were hilarious. I love the futurists. Cara, he was a painter. Marinetti, he was a writer and philosopher, and he wrote the Futurist Manifesto, which is uh, really kind of hilarious when you read it. Um, they loved anarchy, they loved violence, they loved motorbikes, motor cars, aeroplanes, electricity, movement, sound, the urbanization of Italy. These guys were nuts. Boccioni, who was a painter, and so was Bala. Now, if there's one of these guys whose name you should remember, it's this guy, Boccioni. He was probably the most talented out of all of them. But one of his sculptures, this one, Unique Forms of Continuity in Space, 1914, actually appears on the Italian Euro. It is that famous. Futurism is that famous that this piece of art appears on the Euro coin. Futurists loved noise, anarchy, urbanization, and they tried to paint it. They tried to paint noise. They tried to paint electricity. This is a canvas by Boccioni. I believe it's at MoMA too. It's called The Street Enters the House. And when you think about it, 
The street can enter a house or an apartment, can't it? But there's only one way that a street can come into your house, and that's through the noise of the street. And so what Boccioni is trying to do here is to paint the noise of the street. Um, cars and uh, horses and construction workers. The futurists were all about dynamism. They tried to paint movement. This is a futurist painting. I know it looks very abstract and to our eyes it is. But this painting, um, which I think is by Bala, is called uh, either the speed of a motorcycle or the speed of a car. All of the futurist paintings have titles like this. And what Bala was trying to do was show a motorbike as it whizzes past you. Now, when think about it. You're standing on the sidewalk, and if a motorbike speeds past you, your head, your mind, intellectually tells you that you are seeing a motorbike. But what you really see is just this wish, this kind of abstract uh, smudge of metal and wheels and color, right? And this is what Bala is trying to paint. This is one of my favorite paintings of all time. It's called Dynamism of Dog on Leash. Um, again, it's by Bala, I believe. And he's trying to show what it really looks like when you see a little dog, this little, uh, is it, what is it, a dash hound or something? It's little feet whizzing around and its owner's little feet whizzing around. I think that's really, really cute. Epic fail. This is another reason I love futurists. They didn't succeed in painting movement or noise cause, or electricity because it's kind of impossible to paint these things. But in their efforts to try, they came out up with some really adorable canvases. And they would probably kill me, um, any one of them, if they heard me describe their work as adorable. But I think it is. This is my favorite. It's from uh, a futurist who was sort of in the second wave of futurism called Fortunato de Pero. And this painting, and I want you to note how jagged this is. I want you to note the colors of all of these um, paintings. Look at this one. It's called Radio Fire Up. And it depicts the moment when you turn a radio on and it sparks into life with electricity and music and sound. And you can see, actually, if you look, there's um, a little speaker there and he tried to paint the sound waves coming out of it. And on top, you see this little uh, stylized bull. Do you see the little bull over there in the right on top of the sound waves? Well, it's because the song on the radio was about a bullfighter. So they tried to paint what you couldn't see. And they also tried to sculpt it. This I told you about is by Boccioni. It's one of the most famous sculptors ever created, sculptures ever created. It's called Unique Forms of Continuity in Space, 1914 by Boccioni. And what he's trying to do here is depict what it looks like when a person walks. What we really see when a person walks. It's absolutely gorgeous. Epic fail doesn't look anything like a person walking, but it is a gorgeous sculpture. And so, no surprise to see it referenced and paid homage to in fashion. This is a futurist canvas. God knows what it's showing, probably cars or electricity or, or something like that. And look at these vans. They did a whole series of futurist uh, vans. And look at this dress. This dress is actually sculpted to make it look as if the wind is blowing the dress out from behind the model. Such a futurist idea, isn't it? To try to show movement and dynamism. I love the futurists. They were nuts. Cubism. Oh, I know you've all heard about cubism. Let's grapple with it for a second because it really will only take a second. When I was an art history undergrad, I saw in my 20th century art syllabus, cubism. Oh my God, I was so terrified. I feared the isms and I especially feared cubism. There was something so intellectual and grown up and scary about cubism. Guess what, folks? It's the easiest of all. First of all, there are really only two cubists, Brock and his friend, who I know you've heard of, Picasso. Yes, the, um, people, there were a few proto-cubists, a few artists sort of practicing with these ideas, a few post-cubists, but cubism, the famous cubism, these guys, Brack and Picasso, 
out of Paris and basically all Cubism was was an intellectual exercise, a game really. Um, you know we see a Cubist portraiture like here, take a look at the Brock painting on the left. You see it's uh, uh, somebody holding a guitar and you see, look at their face, you see it's all sort of broken up into these uh, spheres, these different spheres. But what the Cubist was simply trying to do was to show all the angles of a face at the same time. That's all they were trying to do. Look at the guitar. The reason you see so many guitars and vases and glasses and vessels in um, Cubist paintings is they were trying to figure out a way, in a fun way, to show the void. What gives a guitar its sound? Well, it's the hollow part, isn't it? Um, a, a vase, you put a vase, actually, I say vase, but I say vase so that you'll understand. Um, it wouldn't be one if you couldn't put flowers in it. A glass has no purpose unless you can fill it with liquid. So they tried to show basically the inside of stuff, um, which is kind of impossible to do. But it was an intellectual exercise. Um, on the right, we have Picasso, again, a much more abstracted view of real things he's trying to paint here. Most Cubist canvases are in these very dull kind of colors. Uh, to be honest with you, I think they're rather dull. Grays and beiges and terracottas and dark brown. And the reason is, it was an intellectual game. If they uh, applied color to this as well, Oh my God, it would just get too confusing. It would be a big mess. So they kept the palette very simple so that the paintings were easier to read. That is what Cubism is. It is nothing to be scared of. Now they did eventually inject a bit of color into their Cubist work. Here is Picasso. And uh, take a look at this. You can see there's a clarinet there. There is a guitar there. Um, this idea of trying to paint the hollows of things. This is very stylized and it's really a lot of fun. Picasso was a fun guy. Keep that in mind. I know we hear the name Picasso and it is so imbued with highfalutin ideas and uh, art theory and intellectualism. Picasso was fun. And also he was an incredibly good draftsman. Um, that's why I think it's always good to learn the craft before you can go off and uh, deconstruct it. He was a fantastic uh, draftsman. He could draw beautifully, very realistically. Um, he learned to do that before he went off on his various uh, adventures. So I think that's a good rule of thumb for life, isn't it? Learn the basic craft before going off and making it your own. This is Mark Jacobs. I believe, yeah, that looks like Mark Jacobs to me. It's certainly ugly enough to be Mark Jacobs. And I hope I don't have to tell you why he was inspired by Cubism here. This is a detail from a very famous early painting by Picasso called Le Demoiselle d'Avignon. And this does live at MoMA again, I think. And it's sort of proto-Cubist. He was very interested in primitivism and all of this kind of stuff. And look at the palette again. Um, these uh, terracottas, these flesh tones, the beiges with this just little bit of uh, periwinkle blue. So take a look at one of those faces then uh, and these colors. Take a look at this. You can see the palette is used, the cubist ideas are used and sometimes, oh my god, this is a close-up of that face and check out what some designer did to his models. There we go. Of course, she looks absolutely awful and ridiculous, but he was not trying to make his models look like monsters, even though they do. He was referencing this very painting, the Demo Demoiselle d'Avignon. So that's Cubism. That's it. Nothing to be scared of at all. Very easy. One of the easiest um, isms, but perhaps not the most fun. All right, let's look at another 
Uh, our next big design aesthetic from the 20th century, Art Deco. Now, I know that many of you have done Art Deco with me before in other classes. Well, guess what, Hotshots? We're going to do it again. You're ahead of the game. You know this shit. Those of you who don't, you're going to love it. Art Deco came about in the 1920s. It was really a reaction to World War I, 1914 to 1918. In the 20s, people wanted to draw a line under everything that went before and start the century over, and this time to make it really, really modern. Art Deco is basically the opposite to Art Nouveau. No nature here. It was all about industry and aeroplanes and cars and uh, modernity. Very, very stylized. In architecture, the most famous deco building is probably this one, the Empire State Building. There are no leaves on this or lion's heads or organic shapes. No, it's very geometric, this stepped geometry that marks deco architecture. Deco furniture, again, very stylized, completely geometric on a very limited palette. Here is a poster. I love it. Look at this stylized deco train. All of these sharp angles and the palette, a lot of silvers. You know, modern, it was about modernity. So you're going to see a lot of blues, a lot of silvers, um, uh, a lot of metallics in deco design. Deco had its own fonts. We still use them today, a deco font. Those of you working in magazines and graphics, somebody requires a deco font, this is what they're after. And of course, Art Deco would impact fashion. Look at these wonderful Art Deco fashion images. The black and white, this limited palette, a lot of slate grays, and of course, the chevrons, these very stark geometric designs. And I hope I do not have to even explain to you why this is inspired by Art Deco. Or this. Or this. In terms of fine art during the Deco period, the artist that we most closely associate with Art Deco is this lady, Tamara de Lempica. She was to Art Deco what Mucha was to Art Nouveau. But look here. Her women are so stylized, and they're all doing modern things, like talking on a telephone or driving a car. Tamara de Lempica was a modernist herself. There she is. You can see she's very, very beautiful. And she had quite the outrageous life of a flapper artist. Really quite incredible. Here is another one of her canvases. And you can see here, look, New York skyline is in the background, skyscrapers. It was about modernity. And fashion still goes back to her constantly. Here are some images from recent fashion magazines, and I hope I don't have to even show you why these are so inspired by her work. All right, another art movement that's very deco in spirit, it was certainly uh, in the same time period, is this, de stil. De stil. Should we say that again? De stil. What language is this? It is Dutch. This came out of Holland, and de stil in Dutch means the style. So you can see there was a great element of pretension already at work with de stil artists. The most famous of which is this guy. I'm sure you've heard of him, Mondrian. And Mondrian did these uh, very geometric mathematical blocked canvases, like this, only in these colors, blue, yellow, red, and black. De Stiel was also a movement in interior design. There were De Stiel couches and De Stiel wallpaper, but I don't even have to show you because it all looked like this. In the 1960s, um, 50 years after De Stiel was around, um, Yves Saint Laurent did his tribute to De Stiel with his Mondrian dress. But you know what? We still go back to De Stiel often in fashion. I don't even have to tell you why all of this stuff is de stiel, do I? Professor Halley does not like de stiel. First of all, those Mondrian canvases, this is just my opinion. 
In all the years I studied art, and I still study art, everything you see in a book or on the internet or in, you know, uh, on a print always looks better in real life. You see, I don't know, uh, um, the street enters the house in a picture. It looks great. You know that Boccioni futurist uh, painting? You see it in real life and it's a million times more beautiful. Uh, the Demoiselle d'Avignon, which looks kind of shit in books, when you see it in real life, it is spectacular and beautiful. De Stiel is the only stuff I have ever seen that looks better in a book than in real life. It's not even neat. That Mondrian stuff, all of those geometric lines, they're not even neat. He didn't even use a ruler. I don't like it at all. It is not my aesthetic at all, but people do love it. So if you see stuff like this, describe it as de Stiel or inspired by Mondrian. Much, much prettier at around the same time was a little art movement called Orphism, which was all very spiritual in nature, all about spiritual feelings and things, but don't get bogged down in that. Think about these gorgeous colours. Uh, there were a few Orphic artists, but the, the most famous and the only ones you need to know are Robert and Sonia Delaunay. They were married and they both did this stuff. And it was beautiful. I love it. These orbs, these colourful orbs. Look at the palette. It's very, very particular, isn't it? It's very beautiful. Sonia Delaunay loved fashion. She was extremely hip. And uh, she would uh, make uh, textiles and... Uh, clothing and scarves, etc., using her wonderful Orphic designs like this. Here is another Orphic canvas. This one, you can see it's not these uh, round orbs, but these strange floating kind of triangles. It really was all about spirituality, about the vibration of color, and all of this kind of groovy stuff. However, it works beautifully when applied to contemporary fashion. Take a look at that absolutely fabulous dress. I really think this is a great dress. Look at the palette. Look at the shapes. Look at how Orphic it is. So when discussing something like this, you would have to describe it as Orphic. And this as well. I didn't even have to show you or, or explain why this is inspired by Orphism, do I? You have eyes. You can see.